think Mars fascinates us a lot because it's one of our closest neighbours in the solar system. It's the, the next closest planet to the Earth. It's something you can see in the sky, red dot in the sky that's fascinated people for a long time. It's also a potential abode for life. So if there is life elsewhere in the solar system, people obviously thought, well, let's look beyond the Earth and we arrive at Mars. Now it's a dry desert. It used to be different and used to be suitable for liquid water. There were rivers, and lakes and maybe life, we don't know. And that's uh, right now for scientists is the big motivation. Mars three billion years ago, a long time ago, was very much like the Earth. Mars, Earth and Venus um, arose at the same time uh, from the same region around the Sun, so the same components. They were very similar at the beginning, but they evolved very, very differently. Venus is very hot, Earth is just right, Mars is too cold. So one of the big questions we have is what is it that shaped the history of the planets and how did life come about on Earth and could there have been life also on Venus or Mars? We know we will not find any traces of life on Venus today because it's way too hot, but Mars may have a secret waiting for us. We are now in a position studying Mars where after a number of missions and more than a decade of exploring Mars and gathering data on that, we, we are understanding some of the processes and, and the behavior of Mars, but uh, we are understanding also that we are missing something. We are starting to see that uh, the lower atmosphere affects the upper atmosphere, that the, the water cycle follows some uh, seasonal changes related to the polar caps. And when there is dust storms, there is a link between the water cycle and the dust abundance in the atmosphere. Mars is not too far away. I've been working on Mars. Hi, my name is Manish Patel. Within our words, we have gathered a number of expertise in order to study like these different the aspects of Mars. The space exploration is uh, very fascinating. Uh, I, I knew it! And realistically, try to understand the planet as a whole. Abwarts is an international project funded by the European Commission and devoted to exploit the available observations and data gathered from previous missions on Mars, including Mars Express, in order to try to build the state of the art understanding Mars in this moment in preparation for the next mission to Mars, ExoMars. ExoMars was born with the objective to put a rover on the surface of Mars to look for traces of life. When we started in 2001, we looked away other missions, notably NASA ones, had looked for life on Mars. And we tried to think, well, they didn't find anything, but why? Is it because they were looking in the wrong place or they were looking the wrong way? How could we do things differently to try to improve our chances of finding traces of life? ExoMars is an ESA program which is uh, operated in collaboration with the Russian Space Agency. Uh, and it consists at the moment of two, uh, two major parts. It's uh, one mission that will be launched in 2016 and that's uh, called the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is an orbiter that will go in orbit around Mars and it will also send a lander down to, um, 
to the surface of Mars. It's called the EDM, it's the Entry, Descent and Landing Demonstrator Module, and it has been also named Schiaparelli. And then there is a second part that will be launched in 2018, uh, which carries a rover that will go down to the surface and make uh, measurements on the surface, take samples of the subsurface and drill down to, to depths to, to investigate uh, Mars. We think that the key to finding biomolecules in a reasonable state of preservation so that we can study them lies in the subsurface. So from the very beginning, uh, ExoMars was planned to be able to reach two meters into the subsurface and collect samples. Now the drill is very interesting because it's like a mini oil platform. In order to reach two meters, you have to assemble four shafts each is roughly 60 centimeters in length. And once you have uh, assembled these four elements, then the drill can reach its maximum length. But it takes a lot of effort and power. It takes about five days to be able to reach two meters into the subsurface. The exploration of Mars is important basically because uh, planetary scientists believe that Mars is a jewel, contains very valuable information about the history of the whole solar system and even about the history of the Earth and the history of life on Earth. We want to know why there is life on Earth. Is it? Uh, uh, very specific to Earth, uh, might we find somewhere else uh, life, um, same kind of life, another kind of life. So the first step is to, to look around us and of course the solar system is the first step. We already have a lot of uh, measurements on mm -hmm. Mars, but of course what is important is uh, the cycles, the climate. So this is a long-term investigation. We don't understand the climate of a planet by just going there one year and then yeah. coming back. But now we have a, uh, data for more than 10 years, a very large data set, including the upper atmosphere, middle atmosphere, surface, subsurface. And now maybe it's time to look again at this, this overall data set from an interdisciplinary point of view because each part is interacting uh, with each other. Upwards is a very good project here because it will uh, learn from the past missions and try to improve what we have learned to the next missions. Uh, ExoMars is the first candidate but there are a lot of missions in the future towards Mars. So, so the project is really to make a link. <laughs> learn thanks to Mars Express about the, the, the details of the ozone, the upper atmosphere, then the, the CO2 ice clouds, the water vapor in the atmosphere. We learn uh, a lot of new things about the mineralogy of the surface, the, the geology, as well as the subsurface water on Mars. What we would try to do with each mission, we want to uh, try to close up the gaps in our knowledge. So when we will learn new things, we will have a rover, we will have an 
atmospheric uh, entry vehicle who will make in-situ measurements. So we will have new data sets, new informations that will be used to go back and study, uh, restudy, or reanalyze the Mars Express data so that we can learn more mm -hmm. about the Mars in more details. What is NOMAD? So NOMAD is a, a spectrometer, so it analyzes the, the light with the means of, in fact, three channels, three small instruments inside the same box. Uh, two are working in the infrared region and one in the UV region. We hope to improve the measurement of methane by uh, using the infrared channel. Therefore, we have uh, one channel which will look directly at the sun doing solar occultation, so uh, looking at the sun as it goes down or up uh, uh, through the atmosphere. And this is a, a method which gives a very, very high level of signal radiation, so we are sure of what we are measuring. And why methane is so important? Well, that's a very good question and a very big question and a very tricky question. Um, methane is important on Mars because it really shouldn't be there. And on the, the inner planets in the solar system, methane should have been long gone. That methane that was here when the, when the planet formed should have been destroyed many, 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 many years ago. So the fact that we see it means that something weird is going on. It has to be produced somewhere for it to still remain. So that's really what's catching people's eyes. There are obviously links to life as well. Now on Earth, uh, a, a large majority of the methane that we have in the atmosphere on Earth comes from organisms, comes from living organisms. So. There's naturally uh, an inclination to, uh, maybe it's due to life. And that's a big question, which I'm not going to comment on, but it, that's the possibility that it raises in people's minds. And that's why it's such a controversial gas to observe. The subsurface of Mars is, compared to the surface, is a much more benign place. It's, it's, it's so much nicer. If you're on the surface of Mars, it's cold, it's low pressure, um, you wouldn't survive there long. Liquid water doesn't survive there long. It quickly uh, it sublimes from, from a solid to, into a gas phase. Below the surface, it's much nicer. So the pressure is higher, the deeper you go. The temperature increases, the deeper you go. So in theory, you could get to a point deep enough below the surface where liquid water could exist. We're fairly certain there isn't active life there, but what there might be is uh, fossil life. There might be the evidence of life from the past. When Mars had a much thicker atmosphere, a much nicer, warmer environment, there is the possibility that, 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 that there were microorganisms existing at that point uh, and are now fossilised within the surface, within the subsurface, in the rocks themselves. And I'm not saying we'll find them, but the possibility exists, and this is the driving force for us trying to understand Mars in more detail. It's a very complicated puzzle, and Upwards will provide some elements to answer that. Upwards will also allow us to um, prepare for taking the data that we receive from that Mars and putting it into our model so that we can understand other situations on Mars. It's a very important activity that we'll be undertaking. Called, it's called data assimilation, where we make a, many, many observations and we record that and we, we find a way of merging that into our model so that we can understand the Martian system better. It's better than just having a, a theory, just a, an observation. You combine the observations on the one hand and the model on the other to produce a consistent fit between the two.
On Earth, this is done a lot actually, the, the, the process was developed on Earth um, formally for weather forecasting and there the problem is that you need to know what the atmosphere is doing now before you can forecast what it's going to do in the future. And of course you'll have observations, you'll have maybe somebody will have measured the surface pressure here, maybe somebody else will have sent up a balloon a hundred miles away and it's hard to see how you combine those. Well data simulation finds a model that sort of acceptably fits all these pieces of information and then that model solution is, if you like, the best guess as to what the atmosphere is doing now. And that's the starting point for your weather forecast. And the answer for Mars actually is surprisingly that we can forecast very well. There are high and low pressure systems on Mars that are actually easier to forecast than those on Earth. And we sometimes had forecasts that worked for 10 or 20 days into the future, maybe even 30 days, whereas on Earth, five days is very good. I've done this personally for um, landing, um, for example, from Mars Science Laboratory, Curiosity as it's known. We needed to look at the weather every day for a long time before it landed and to see if there were any dust clouds, if there was any signs of the weather changing, if there was any danger to the land, landing of the spacecraft. And in fact, um, the weather did pretty much what we expected. We made a very, quite a good forecast. On the Earth, the climate system is made complex because of the ocean, the clouds, the rain. That's really what makes it complex. Mars is much drier, but the climate system is complex by itself because of other processes which are not as important on the Earth, like you have dust, a dust cycle, dust storms. They are in the atmosphere. They control the, the opacity and the heating of the surface and of the atmosphere. You have a water cycle as well with water ice clouds. They have a little impact on the climate, but still a bit the same. And you have something which is very exotic for the Earth. It's what we call the CO2 cycle. The fact that the CO2 atmosphere can condense to form clouds, but also on the surface to form polar caps that makes the climate, uh, the system to vary the pressure. The pressure varies a lot with season. And overall, you have a climate system, you have climate and meteorology just like on the Earth. Water is related to life, but only liquid water. On the Earth, wherever you have liquid water, you have life. But when we have no liquid water, like in Antarctica when it's very cold, you have no life at all. You need water, but especially liquid water. And on Mars, at the surface, right now, you cannot have liquid water. And the way it was gone away, uh, I think it still matters to speculation, but we have now a mission around Mars, which is called MAVEN, which is just focused on understanding how the atmosphere is actually leaving the Martian environment and how the water which was once in the atmosphere is actually leaving the atmosphere of Mars to be lost in space. 
and we believe that most of the water and most of the atmosphere has been lost in space. All the water on Mars tends to follow a cycle from the icy reservoir to the atmosphere, where you have water vapor, which is transported by the atmosphere, and forming clouds, little snow, frost on the surface at some season. But when spring comes back, typically, like on the Earth, this, this snow and this frost sublimes, uh, evaporates back in the atmosphere, and you have a cycle like that. No, I think it's uh, widely recognized that clouds play a major part of the water cycle in a way which is difficult to explain, but uh, we need to understand that clouds actually uh, can play a part which is different compared to water vapor because they have particles which are heavy enough, they can fall, so they change the way water can be uh, distributed across the Martian globe. But now we also realize that they change the climate of Mars. You have two big kind of clouds. You have the first kind of clouds, which are the water ice clouds, like on the Earth. Not like the big clouds that rains like today, but more like uh, uh, Thyrus, the thin ice clouds that we see very high in the atmosphere. But you have another kind of clouds, which is completely different. These are made of CO2 ice, dry ice. And we don't have that on the Earth at all. You have that on Mars because on Mars the atmosphere is mostly made of carbon dioxide and in the upper atmosphere when it's very cold, this carbon dioxide can condense and form these very exotic clouds. I say exotic because to the eye, to our eye, they look like water ice clouds, but in reality they behave completely differently. The process that forms them is completely different and that's something which is also uh, something we plan to work on. Mars' surface is completely covered by dust and the winds lift this dust from the surface to the atmosphere. The dust is transported both vertically up to 10 kilometers, a few tens of kilometers up, and horizontally by the winds. What is unique on Mars is the so-called dust storm season. Now during this period on Mars, we have huge dust storms every year that can last for several weeks, and sometimes they can evolve into full global dust storms. A global dust storm on Mars is one of the most dramatic dynamical phenomena in the entire solar system. Over the course of a few weeks, the dust is swept into the atmosphere to form a veil that almost completely surround the planet. Gold meat plug, Jurana. <laughs> From a climatological point of view, dust can be considered as the most important component of the Martian atmosphere. Indeed, by absorbing and emitting infrared radiation, both day and night, dust can either limit or enhance the radiative cooling of the atmosphere to space. As a consequence, either relatively small amounts of dust in the atmosphere can dramatically affect the circulation and the climate of the planet. Trace gases are atmospheric components which are present in small concentration, making up less than 1% by volume of the atmosphere. Even if they have a small abundance in the atmosphere, actually they play an important role because they could be signatures of 
biological, geological and dynamical processes at present or in the past. PFS and Omega are two instruments of Mars Express, are complementary and both are able to acquire the radiation reflected by the planet and passing through the atmosphere. In this passing through the atmosphere, the light is both absorbed and scattered by molecules, by gases, and by particles, as dust or water ice particles composing the clouds. These instruments, PFS and Omega, demonstrated that it's possible to use the the, the information coming from the light in the instruments to retrieve uh, the water content, the water composition, the methane, other minor species, dust and water ice properties. And among all the valuable uh, results coming from uh, the use of PFS and Omega, we can uh, remind uh, the first detection of methane. Since its discovery, the origin of methane on Mars represents a great challenge for the planetologists. New constraints, new observations, as for example, measurements of other related trace species in the atmosphere of Mars, will allow to distinguish between a biological or geological origin of methane on Mars. Marte, geológicamente, destaca por estructuras muy impresionantes, por ejemplo, el volcán más grande del Sistema Solar, que es el Olympus Mon, también otras estructuras muy grandes en comparación con la Tierra, como el Valle Marineris o la Cuenca de Elas. También se puede destacar de su geología, que hay dos zonas muy diferenciadas, tiene una dicotomía muy marcada, en el hemisferio norte unas tierras más bajas y en el hemisferio sur unas tierras mucho más altas. Además, tuvo mucha agua líquida, por lo que formó muchas estructuras geológicas que también podemos ver en la Tierra, pero a, a mayor tamaño. ¿no? Podemos ver muchos canales, depósitos fluviales, incluso se puede hablar de, de antiguos océanos en este planeta. Los mm, primeros aproximadamente mil millones de años, Marte fue bastante activo, no comparado con los canales terrestres, pero sí bastante activo. Y luego, a partir de eso, como dos mil millones de años después de su formación, la actividad fue decreciendo paulatinamente y sobre todo focalizándose en áreas concretas. Sigue existiendo algo de vulcanismo, probablemente algo de tectónica, pero casi todo es muy disminuido y en zonas muy concretas. La estructura térmica de la litosfera nos informa sobre cómo el planeta ha cambiado su estado térmico, como las rocas, su comportamiento es dependiente de la temperatura y la litosfera tiene un registro de, de cómo se comportaba en la antigüedad, pues nos va diciendo cómo, cómo estaban de calientes. En lo que estamos trabajando ahora mismo es en generar mapas de flujo térmico. Estos mapas los generamos a través de datos del espesor de la litosfera y de la producción de calor radiactivo de los elementos radiactivos que tenemos en Marte. Todos estos datos nos sirven para eso, para crear mapas de, de flujo térmico que, que nos irán indicando eh, pues cuál es el flujo térmico del planeta, podremos ver la evolución térmica del planeta y también contrastaremos las variaciones regionales de este flujo térmico en, pues por, todo, por todo Marte.
beginning of the solar system, the, the origin of the atmospheres of the terrestrial planet is similar, so we think that the atmosphere was similar. But today they are very different, so we know that the, the atmosphere has evolved. We believe that there was some moment in the history of Mars where something drastic happened, some dramatic change. Perhaps the interior of Mars became very cold and uh, the release of gases to the atmosphere stopped um, severely and uh, perhaps the oceans uh, uh, froze and or evaporated and uh, there was not a real feedback between the surface and the atmosphere and then the atmosphere eventually collapsed. Um, the escape to space could have played a very important role as well. We think that the Martian atmosphere at the beginning was much thicker, so the temperature was larger and liquid water was possible on the surface of Mars. The atmosphere escaped, so now we have an atmosphere that is much thinner, there is no liquid water, so the solar radiation can penetrate easily the Martian atmosphere, so there are many many different aspects that, has, yeah, that are influenced by the atmospheric escape. The question is why this escape has occurred. And one of the biggest reasons is that uh, the Martian atmosphere has no magnetosphere, so it's basically opened to the solar winds. And it has made the, the solar wind to blow up all the lighter species in the, in the top, and also some other processes that make the escape possible. And this has actually ended up in a very, very thin uh, atmosphere. We are going to analyze uh, the Mars Express data uh, together with the use of global, global models and our aim is to derive uh, temperatures and densities in the upper atmosphere and that's very important because the, the temperature and density of the upper atmosphere is uh, essential to understand the rate of the escape processes today. At the end we have uh, two planets which are kindly uh, similar and kindly different but the physics behind are the same. So our long experience in the Earth atmosphere can be used to be applied in the other planets. And this is what actually I'm going to do. I'm going to adapt the retrieval codes and the non-LTE codes that we have been using in the Earth atmosphere to the Mars conditions. And this is going to end up in, hopefully, a long-term uh, seasonal and latitudinal distribution of temperatures, densities, and CO density also. ISAC is like the digital library of the universe. We like to call it ourselves because this is the place where we are hosting all the science archives from all ESA space science missions. Not only for Mars, which is part of the planetary science archive, but we also store data from all other planetary missions, such as Rosetta, uh, Venus Express, but also all astronomy missions, Herschel, Hubble, Planck, Gaia, which is soon coming. As you can imagine, it's a long way from Mars uh, down to Earth. So it starts uh, in the in the instruments when they take the images or the of the or the, the spectra of the atmosphere, and this goes into the memory of the spacecraft. This goes to the antenna of the spacecraft that communicates to the antennas here on Earth. Actually, we have a, a network of antennas distributed all over the planet, and then these antennas transmit all the data centralized to the operations center in Germany. And then we get them here and we process them to actually make something that is more readable by by the scientists. If we consider all the archives at ISAC, we have about 500 terabytes. And soon, with Gaia, we are going to duplicate that number. And later on, in a few years, with uh, Euclid in uh, 2020, we will, uh, we will have around 150 petabytes, so 150 million terabytes. In principle, it should be possible for interested members of the public to, to go to the archive and see nice pictures at that level, but a more real the purpose of the archives, of course, is to serve the scientific community and allow detailed scientific analysis of the data. So in scientists will have completely free access, worldwide access, ready, easy access to all the science data from any of our planetary missions. 
and then perform their own analysis if they wish. I think upwards is, is the example of what's, what should be done in terms of, of research. So when we are talking about the human exploration or the, 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 or the robotic exploration of Mars, this needs to be a, a, an international collaboration. We actually need in the, to involve all the people that we can, collaborate all together to go there and, and put all of our expertise to get, uh, to get the most out of, of, of Mars and, uh, and increase the, our knowledge. The ultimate aim is human exploration of Mars, so ESA has an aim to, to, to get a, a person to Mars at some point in the future. Before that, there's many steps that we have to achieve. Uh, the shorter term, the medium term goal is sample return from Mars. Grab some sample, carefully selected sample, and bring back to the Earth to analyze them. We dream of doing what we call sample return, to really do analyze the piece of Mars with the full laboratories that we have on the Earth. We can't do that on Mars very well. That's the graal, that's the dream of many Mars scientists and space agencies. But that's very expensive. Ultimately, maybe, we would like to send humans. Before we can send humans to Mars, we have to solve a number of issues. Number one is the exposure to radiation that astronauts can get on the way to Mars. The trip to Mars one way takes about a year and during that time the spacecraft would be out of the protection that the magnetic field of the Earth gives us. They could get radiation poisoning and die in a matter of days or develop cancer. Problem number two, they have to bring with themselves everything they drink they eat and they breathe. That's tons and tons of food, water, air. So we need to find a way to be able to develop at least part of that on the surface of Mars. Number three, you may have seen some of these concepts for having little colonies on Mars and they look very nice. You see these pictures where you have one module and another module by it. We cannot do that today. Uh, Europe has always supported mission to Mars. Uh, we have throughout Europe a um, large community, um, very good scientists. We must be proud of our scientists and our science and our institutions. I think that in the Mars community, Europe is a leading is a leading position. So we must continue that, and that's why upwards is important because it's a link between the past missions and the new missions, in which Europe is uh, very involved. Planetary exploration is full of surprises, so we are working on trying to do science predictions and exploring open problems on Mars, but some of the best science waiting for us is going to be surprise. We don't know, because every mission to Mars brings us surprises. So I will encourage everyone, keep an eye on Mars, because surprises are waiting.